talk about a green moonshot and a green new deal. And we have to be willing to take some risks because there is no perfect plan. If that perfect plan existed, it would have been executed. But the reality is that the Fed, it is not within their purview, right? And it is not within the purview of the board of ExxonMobil. Like that is just not what they do. And activist hedge funds are not going to save us as our white knights. And the US government and the EU, those political systems are just not working right now in the way that we need them to for this outcome. And we are in this hole. And what we're trying to say is like, we have a ladder. That ladder might be imperfect right now, but we clearly need to begin taking some wild chances. And this is one I'm not here to report or say that crypto is the solution to climate change, but I feel very confident in saying that the solution involves crypto. Maybe I'll finally get the answer to what the blockchain is. I'm going to try one more time. <laughs> For the life of me. What's that? It's the blockchain. What is it? I don't know. It's just a, it's just a ledger. It doesn't, it's nothing more than a place to write stuff down. All right, all right. I can handle that, but then I don't know why it's eating more electricity and because you, know. you because every like just think of it like every time something gets on it in uh, certain chains thousands and thousands and thousands of people have to confirm it whereas in wait a minute like, who's confirming it individuals they don't even know they're doing it. they're just validators Adam, help me. i'm here to help, <laughs> help <Good. me. laughs> welcome so before we get started on everything else priscilla's asking a very cogent question which is what is the blockchain what is wait a, minute, a blockchain? Wait, it's my question. You okay, already well, uh, Adam, ahead. just quickly, in two sentences, Great. the challenge. It's a new way to develop the internet that is different from how the existing internet works and its primary benefits, which is really what matters to us as the users of it, not as the developers, is that it is way more traceable and transparent than the way that the existing internet works. That's number one. Number two, it can be developed in a way that is faster and more shareable. And that phrase is actually called composability. But it really means that like when a developer builds a certain block of code, other developers or entrepreneurs can borrow that code and then just kind of slot it into their own product, kind of like a programmable Lego block. Is that like a Creative Commons type idea or... In other words, you can borrow, or is it is there proprietary? Yeah, it, it is actually a phrase that is known as composability. So you are you are basically recomposing somebody else's code for your own purposes. Now, there's a third benefit I do want to get to. That's just basically that you, Priscilla, you, Jesse, me, Adam, we own our own data. And a great way to think about blockchain, what is blockchain, is actually to think of what it's not. It's not a closed ecosystem. It's an open ecosystem. So when you are on Facebook, for example, or Twitter, and you want to leave, you are prohibited from taking your followers or your pictures or your data with you. You don't own your data. Facebook does. Twitter does. The other piece there, which goes back to this creative commons concept, it's that Twitter and Facebook and let's say many of the other social media apps like Instagram, they all have news feeds, right? So they have these like closed ecosystems and all their designers and developers and strategists they're rebuilding the same things over and over. And they're competing with each other because they're closed ecosystems. With blockchain and the ecosystem around blockchain and the ethos, when a development team builds a solution, others can borrow it. They can see it. They can what's called fork it. Like they can copy and paste the code and reutilize, repackage it, recompose it. So that means in a sense that once a problem is solved using blockchain, it never needs to be resolved. You don't need to continue to reinvent the wheel over and over. Sorry, that was more than two sentences. But the yeah. two sentences, it was it's two a paragraph. new form <laughs> of internet. So, and so there are many benefits. Fundamentally, what does the blockchain do? It's persistent memory. So it's, it's in terms of everything in history that's gone before is basically forgotten. And now we have this blockchain. And what's it going to do? What's the promise of it? The blockchain has the ability not only to look into the past, and provide transparency about what is the state of everything that happened? What, what is the historical state of the ledger, right? 
which is very helpful for auditability and traceability, let's say for industries such as anything related to finance or perhaps supply chain or auditing of natural resources, which is what we are involved in. The future promise of blockchain, and it's, it's like too broad of a question to answer here when we begin to think about media and art and a variety of different applications. For my industry, which is environmental sustainability and economic opportunity. The blockchain can create new rails, new methods of transacting capital across borders from person to person in a way that is both faster and more efficient, that is lower cost and is fully auditable and accountable. So for example, we are working with some partners based in the Philippines and based in Northern Africa related to plastic removal and another for environmental sustainability and sustainable infrastructure, like developing renewable energy infrastructure, as well as some microfinance lending. We, as the Bickering ecosystem or participants using our blockchain, can connect with those accounts, those wallet holders, instantaneously over a blockchain with a click of a button. An individual who is based in the Philippines can borrow money from me via the blockchain, totally anonymously, without having to go through like a KYC or AML process or have to go through JP Morgan Chase or their regional banks. They can do so within a matter of minutes, both parties on either end, plus the entire world, the entire internet can see that that transaction occurred, which wallets the capital was, the cryptocurrency was sent from and sent to, and can ensure that that was a totally legitimate and non-fraudulent transaction. And the future financial products that can be developed from this are not only futuristic, many of them have not been even imagined yet. A teacher question. Okay, so when we talk about the, you know, everyone can see it, the sort of transparency, if you will, right? Why would a sort of financial institution be threatened by this if it's, you know, what is it going to put a bank out of business? You know, should a bank, should JP or investor or financial markets just adapt and just, I mean, and is that, was that good or is that not, is that antithetical what we're trying to do? Boy, that is the $100,000 question. I'm going to postulate that the blockchain will either completely usurp the banks, the existing banking infrastructure, and dethrone them, or will fully assimilate them in a matter of years. The issue is there's no you know, fees that can be charged. Adam can just give you the money and you could just give it back to him. So there are some network fees. There are some network fees, yeah. right? But we're talking just about it in an infrastructure, a new infrastructure for transacting currency. We shouldn't even call it currency, just digital files that have some type of real world value. That is a better mousetrap than the existing system, not by a little bit, but by orders of magnitude, right? And they operate as organ organizationally, they operate much more efficiently. They're not overwhelmed with the type of human capital and overhead and compliance that the banks are. Right? There are a lot of virtues to this notion of decentralization and kind of network capabilities that you do not have with the larger banks. And I think that we will see, we're, we are already seeing an assimilation of blockchain technology with the more established financial institutions throughout the world. We saw last week, BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, announced that it wants to launch a, a crypto and crypto tech ETF. There are other Bitcoin ETFs that currently exist, Bitcoin futures contracts. We see many of the banks working with large consulting and design agencies to build and integrate blockchain technology into their own operations. So I think that we're already seeing, but we will see more so the integration of blockchain within companies that right now are only, that are still like using the web, more traditional internet capabilities. And we will also just eventually see how that technology results in more efficiency at these organizations. And in many cases, unfortunately, that also means job cuts mm -hmm. for many tasks that can be done faster by a computer. And that's not really endemic to a blockchain, but simply that technology in many ways is an alternative to human labor. And when it's able to do the same task for pennies on the dollar, it's a very easy decision for a, for a, a manager or an institution to integrate. So Polkadot, why are you... Why are you on Polkadot? It has great promise, but it's not all realized yet. So why are you building your protocol on top of Polkadot? And what We're does it extremely... mean for, for Priscilla? Like, what is Polkadot? Yeah. For me, yes. What is yeah. it? Okay. 
All right, Priscilla, we'll take you back a little bit. We'll do a quick 101 on crypto blockchain. And after this, you're going to be an advanced game player. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we generally refer to the blockchain, right? Your opening question, what is the blockchain with a capital B? The reality is that there are many, many blockchains, hundreds, if not thousands. Now, we only discuss the most popular ones, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot, Cosmos, Cardano, Avalanche, and a few others. But in the general, like the general populace is likely only aware of a handful of blockchain projects. And these can kind of be categorized by their various functions. Bitcoin, for example, is the earliest primitive. It's the prototype for all of these existing blockchains that we participate in. And Bitcoin really only serves the purpose of a cryptocurrency, like a store of value. It has really been, it's been unsuccessful in its other aims and aspirations. After Bitcoin, there was a project that was launched by Vitalik Buterin called Ethereum. Ethereum was a major departure from the underlying structure of Bitcoin. Instead of being merely a cryptocurrency, Ethereum is a smart contract platform. In some ways, it's an operating system that allows other development teams to build their own products on top. Think of it like Microsoft Windows, and then all the different windows on your, on your desktop are apps. Or like your, your, your iPhone, if you have an iPhone or you're an Android, you have Google or iOS as the operating system, and then you have an app store which hosts apps. The blockchain is, in effect, an operating system, just like Android or iOS, thanks to Ethereum and Vitalik Buterin and his team, who created this notion that blockchain can do more and has greater promise than just being a cryptocurrency. It can be an operating system for other development teams to build their own products and apps. And most of the blockchains that you've heard of now are derived from this model that was pioneered by Ethereum, that it's an operating system for other apps. An issue with Ethereum that Polkadot resolves is that Ethereum is a general purpose blockchain. It's an open network, and any development team that wants to use that base operating layer can do so. So the use cases for Ethereum, one of its benefits is its diversity. So teams build applications in metaverse and NFTs and financial products, what's called DeFi, decentralized finance, or identity management. The NBA participates on Ethereum. Like there are a myriad of uses, right? Because of that, however, Ethereum gets a bit clogged up and congested. Because these different use cases, let's say like sustainable finance, which is what Bitgreen wants to do versus metaverse are two completely different applications, right? With different needs. The Ethereum blockchain, which is a general purpose blockchain, tries to satisfy all of the use cases. So therefore, they don't really optimize for any specific use case, right? Try to satisfy everyone, you actually optimize for nobody. Polkadot is different. The founder of Polkadot, the CEO, Gavin Wood, is the former CTO of Ethereum and left the Ethereum project years ago because he kind of presciently foresaw this problem of congestion for a general purpose blockchain. What Polkadot does is very interesting. Instead of having one general purpose blockchain, Polkadot is kind of like a hub and a spoke of a wheel. And Polkadot, its initial blockchain, which is called a relay chain, sits at the center. And it supports different blockchains that shoot off of its center similar to individual blockchains, right? And they operate in parallel, which the Polkadot team calls parachains, parallel blockchains. And each of those chains has its own purpose. There's one for DeFi, there's one for Metaverse, there's one for NFTs, there's ones for identity management. And Bitgreen approached the Polkadot team with this proposition to say, you have this notion of purpose-built blockchains. Right, Polkadot in many ways is just a, a constellation of many purpose-built blockchains that work in tandem, but they are separate. Our purpose is purpose. We created a blockchain that is optimized with its governance capabilities and its economics, which are called tokenomics, token economics, right? To intentionally incentivize the type of outcomes that we want to see in the world, which is sustainable behavior. Right. So, yeah, but for most, a lot of people maybe watching or listening to this, will you just explain how up till now the blockchain is wreaking havoc or Ethereum as great as it might've been in its inception, there is this environmental component and just the quick, you know, it's using too much, whatever that is, power, electricity, and then how 
Polkadot and these new systems you're talking about are going to figure that part of it out. Yeah, there is an outcry amongst environmentalists and many folks who are not environmental by training. And I did a master's in sustainable systems and I was very cynical about cryptocurrency and I didn't purchase for a very long time because I had such a a visceral philosophical objection. And I've kind of tempered that. The original blockchain designs, Bitcoin and then eventually Ethereum, and Ethereum is, is beginning to move away from this design, right? Consumes a significant amount of energy as not a consequence of, but actually as a tool to create a more secure network. Bitcoin utilizes or consumes a vast amount of electricity, literally by design, by intention. And it's actually quite brilliant in the way that it works. And some would postulate that Bitcoin in its current scalability is actually not what Satoshi intended originally. And now like the price, it has scaled and become so popular and obviously the price is so high that it is incentivizing a certain behavior that Satoshi did not have in mind when he wrote his original white paper. However, environmentalists and others who are concerned, what they should be careful to do is to criticize or castigate all of cryptocurrency based on the designs that Bitcoin follows. That design, the key here is this phrase, proof of work. That is the system of consensus or security that is used by the Bitcoin network. And it is also used by Ethereum right now, even though Ethereum is transitioning away to a new method. Every new blockchain from about 2017 onward uses an entirely different consensus mechanism known as proof of stake. Not the stake that you eat, but stake. We don't need a stake over here, just saying. Some of we us. don't do the stake. I know. I know the environmentalists cringed on that one, <laughs> no, but I'm... it's proof of stake, S-T-A-K-E. And then there are other varieties of proof of stake. That is a de- an evolution, a departure from the proof of work mechanism that is used by Bitcoin and, and maybe Ethereum for a little while longer. And this proof of stake, these blockchains, Polkadot is one, Bitgreen is one, Cosmos is another, Tezos, there are, there are many. The newer blockchains, they actually consume 99.5% less electricity than the Bitcoin network effectively like no more than your computer or like actually the amount of electricity that is used to pour yourself a glass of water. This is effectively the trajectory of the evolution of blockchain technology. There is the older version, which is Bitcoin, and Bitcoin will remain on proof of work. And then there are many newer technologies that are using different methodologies that have a very trivial environmental impact. So is the idea that instead of being low energy, in, in itself, you're going to do offsets? That's right. So the chain itself is as environmentally efficient as any other blockchain. It like hardly uses anything more than a trivial amount of electricity. Mm-hmm. So that's a great place to start, right? Living out your values. But then what really makes us green are the, act- are the activities that we plan to incentivize and motivate on chain. Mm-hmm. And we want to raise a trillion dollars for ESG within a decade. Mm-hmm. And that's a moonshot or like a Saturn shot idea. But the reality is that that is only 2% of all of most estimates that are needed to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, which is only eight years away. Hmm. That comes out to about 4 trillion a year. So when we think about all of cryptocurrency, which is a market cap of about 2 trillion, it's a fraction. It's almost barely a blip on the radar screen of the total amount that is needed over the next eight years. So our goal is to help raise this capital. Let, let's talk about ESG for a second. So, you know, let's explain Wait, what that let's, is. Let's give the, you know, say the words because environmentally sustainable governance, is that what it is? It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it actually covers environmental and social so, governance. Yeah. But a lot of people interchange sustainability yeah. or they'll, or they'll um, do environmental and social good. Right. There isn't really a definition for oh, the impact, ESG. Sustainability so, there is, but it gets greenwashed. So why does it need to be on chain at all? Why, why does it need to be on any chain? What, what's the advantage? Well, right now there are efficiencies that can be captured by using on-chain governance as well as cryptocurrency that are not possible by going through like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, or even so, relying on existing governmental bodies or NGOs. So the idea would be that you're either through the smart contract or a DAO 
you're putting governance in over the top of whatever you're agreeing to do. Right. It's and efficiency in how not only capital is transacted, but also how many of their natural resources, let's say, or real world impact is being recorded and then standardized and then made auditable in a publicly available database. So this is important to just really translate is that sometimes you hear, well, we're giving all this money to an NGO and even the best, sometimes the money's going directly to staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one point, right? So there's this accountability, transparency, the money goes directly to the issue that we're trying to solve for that particular NGO, correct? That's right. And then allows for more players. So if I care about something, I might be able to, across the world, see a problem and then contribute, right? So it becomes international or are these, do these have to be governed nation by nation? Are we able to go break through? It is, it is. One of the beauties of cryptocurrency is that it is borderless, not only in terms of the applications that are built on top of the database, but teams. My team has only one individual based in the US. We are in Germany, Portugal, Dubai, Australia, Brazil, right? And so Priscilla, to your point, Here's an example of a type of product that we're building on top of a chain, right? It relates to carbon credits and e ecosystem credits. Right now, many of the best projects in the world are actually never credentialed. They're never capable of moving through a creditation process. That process might take anywhere from 12 to 18 months or longer and cost several hundred thousands of dollars. It's not easy and it's very, very expensive to go from having a, a project somewhere in Mozambique, or let's say a hydro facility in the DRC, having to make that project or that land prepared for an audit, also working with the local community to ensure that we're not arriving on an airplane and showing them saying, we want to token, we want to creditize your land, right? And then not give you anything. So there's time that it takes to work with the community to make that project prepared for audit, then to set an auditor to the location to go through a, val a validation, a verification process, actually ascertaining how much carbon actually is being sequestered, then taking that data, bringing that data to the certifying bodies, Gold Standard, Vera, South Pole, and others, getting permission to create carbon credits. And then you still have to sell those carbon credits, which is probably like a brokered market. That whole process might be 18 months or longer and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, meaning this community in Mozambique has no chance of participating in that value chain, we can change that, right? So in Mozambique, they need fiat currency. So how do they how do they take a, you know, they're not going to go to their supermarket and get Bitcoin, right? <laughs> so how do you deal with the fiat that they the fiat currency they need regular currency? Well, so, I mean, look, El, El Salvador, Bitcoin is huge in El Salvador, right? Yeah. And crypto is huge in in Argentina and, and many other countries. You know, there's a proposal in the state of Arizona to accept cryptocurrency as mm -hmm. as tender as legal tender. In this scenario, Jesse, to your point, um, which I think is really around currency risk, as well as going from crypto into fiat, well, mm -hmm. there are these floating, there are currencies that have variable pricing, like Bitcoin, the price goes up and down every day, same with Ethereum. But there are other currencies that are known as stable coins. So, so their value is- it, You're going to peg it to the dollar? Basically. Yeah. So you peg a crypto to the value of a global fiat currency, like the euro or mm -hmm. the dollar. And then what would happen is- let's say a payment, like Priscilla wants to support this carbon, carbon project in Mozambique. Great. Or it's a microfinance project. So she goes to Bitgreen where it's, they're, sim they're similar to like an eBay style marketplace or like almost a Kickstarter marketplace okay. where she can sort by her UN SDGs that she's interested in or regions. Right. There's a variety of different metrics, right? She can invest her cryptocurrency into a smart contract right? That's consummating this, this virtual contract for carbon credits, let's say. Once that enough capital, enough crypto is actually invested or committed into that smart contract, it automatically closes. It then sends that cryptocurrency, the stable coin, to a wallet that is held by somebody who is on location. Or maybe it's distributed to many people in a community, perhaps that are like taking microloans, right? Which is what Grameen Bank does so incredibly well throughout the global South, right? But like to Priscilla's point, that dollar that comes to the United States really becomes like 35 cents or maybe it's 50 cents by the time it mm -hmm. arrives where it needs to, right? But with crypto, you can send it right to Priscilla or right to the person in the last mile. And this is actually, while crypto might sound complex and admittedly it is, this process already exists with M-Pesa and a variety of other digital currencies mm -hmm. that are 
using not only mobile phones, but in some ways using telecom minutes, right? Mm -hmm. right. So a person who, has, who owns a phone in Kenya, let's say, or is in Nairobi, can use their phone to buy a card, buy a phone card, and then swap that into local currency or go from local currency into a digital currency. So how do you source if you're if you're going to do micro you know loans? It's hard to source these deals. We have been all over the world doing that. You know, it it's is. like you know. So how do it's you do headache, that? You, the headache that I can't even begin to contemplate. Right. Even if it wasn't a bank, let's just say it was somebody who wanted to do this. How can they use your company to to make it easier or faster? The way that we're going to set up our initial marketplaces is through a syndicate model. Now, the syndicate would have some form of intermediary who is an existing participant in the ecosystem or maybe an impact investor. Those groups or group of individuals would bring their projects to us mm -hmm. so that to our us, due the diligence community, needs to be us, us, the community or us, the company? Okay, great question. Initially, it is likely our team that is vetting the initial projects. Okay. For example, one of the projects is a large retrofit project to take low-income homes in the U.S. and then try to retrofit those buildings and infrastructure because the people who live there don't have the capacity to make investments in their mm -hmm. own homes and they don't own the property and their electricity bills are like through the roof. They're like three, four X what you and I might pay, right? So we have a partner who has been doing the due diligence on these deals, is going to be co-investing alongside of the Big Green Network and our team is doing the due diligence of the partner, not of the individual deal itself to start. And then we make available this project and the due diligence process to our entire network. And then there are ways using cryptocurrency where we can incentivize folks to do some of the analysis and to give an opinion on whether the network ought to support a certain investment. And also via crypto, we can allow the network, if we would like, to vote on whether we make this investment available. And we see that happening with DAOs. I think you mentioned that a bit earlier, right? These are democratized organizations that have not central leadership, but in many ways are empowering and enfranchising their participants through the cryptocurrency to participate. So in an example like that, like let's just say it's a it's a building, right? And you're trying to get the energy costs down, but but in order to really make the investment work, there needs to be philanthropy, debt, venture, you know, you need to stack all these different yeah, things. That's financial quite, stack. You know, it's quite, it's a quite complicated thing. How do you as a company deal with that? Are you just at one place in the stack? We have the vision that for all ESG investing or participation, it may not be a, a, a risk or a return-based investment, that Big Green will be a blockchain environment where all of, where the entire financial stack can take place. Okay. That's another reason why we wanted to be our own chain and not just one app on top of Ethereum, because we felt that many of the participants, like you guys or me or maybe a family office, participates at the philanthropic level, mm. at the patient capital level, and at the like risk capital level as well, right? And they're not going to want, and it will be utterly uh, impractical, to ask them to be on Ethereum for your philanthropic activities, but then be on Cosmos for carbon credits and then be on Solana for microfinance and then like have five different wallets and then have to bridge your coins and your money and then hold your assets everywhere. We felt that those full stack investors or even multi-stack, right? will want to be in one place with one trusted brand where they can do all of their business related to ESG investing. So yes, the idea here is on Bitgreen, we will have philanthropy. We will have less risky investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then there potentially could be riskier investment opportunities. Our team is focused on building the blockchain, right? The infrastructure and the, the picks and shovels, and then allowing other teams to build many of those other various products that are kind of like stars that then align into one constellation for, for sustainable finance. Chain. Okay, you're building. I mean, it's it's a wonderful idea. I mean, it's a great thing. It's a great thing that you're doing. But there feels like there's all these different now competing forces out in the blockchain. You know, in the metaverse. Like there's right. So there's you're doing something. I'm going to use the words for good. We understand that. That's we're devoted to those ideas. But is it weird to have all these different kinds of chains out there? 
I mean, is that like a strange thing? Jesse, I'm asking you as well. Like, oh, well, um, <laughs> I, it just appears complex. And at the beginning, it's, I think it's, uh, All right. there's a lot of, you know, it's like when Henry Ford started his car business, there were hundreds of car businesses, you know, and then they just get whittled down to the ones that survive. And nobody survived yet in this marketplace. <laughs> Adam, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, well, it's a very astute point, uh, especially when you think of the blockchain, again, capital B, or metaverse, like it's everything, or all NFTs. And it's even overwhelming to me. Like I have had to stop paying attention to a lot of this stuff that's out there. I do find that some communities and some subgroups within the, I'll call it just the global crypto community, are very receptive to our offering and other groups are hostile. And they don't believe that sustainability has any role to play within crypto. Why? Or that we are trying to like mark the reputation of some other chains. So I try to respond to that by saying, we're not trying to force or project sustainability onto the crypto community. We're not saying like, what is the role of sustainability in crypto? Like, what's the role of sustainability at Exxon? Well, the answer is no, there isn't, right? It's, it's, it's artificial. But we are trying to ask, what's the role of crypto and sustainability? And how can we take this extraordinarily promising and powerful technology, right? And then use the best parts of it to try to advance the type of outcomes that we want to see in the real world. And the reality is, I think, for everyone who's listening and watching right now and the members of our community, right? We wouldn't be in this scenario if reliance on the existing military industrial complex or whatever you want to say, corporates, government, energy, if that situation were working in our favor, then we would not be in the hole that we are in. And at the very least, you know, I would ask environmentalists and others to give us and other crypto teams a shot, even yeah. though, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, but I, I think what you're saying is, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm excited about this, because I think when you think about those who might be the naysayer, could we think about even the sort of discovery or the creation of this was to, again, decentralize and, you know, kind of take the power away from just governments or whatever. And so here we have the same potential problem anyway, right? We're going to, we're yeah. still going to end up with the same problem if we don't kind of come up with a different idea because someone's yeah. going to I mean, don't, I mean, in fairness, like we all watched that speech by JFK at Rice, right? We're going to the moon and we talk about a green moonshot and a green new deal. And we have to be willing to take some risks because there is no perfect plan. If that perfect plan existed, it would have been executed. But the reality is that the Fed, it is not within their purview, right? And it is not within the purview of the board of Exxon Mobil. Like that is just not what they do. And activist hedge funds are not going to save us as our white knights. And the US government and the EU, those political systems are just not working right now in the way that we need them to for this outcome. And we are in this hole. And what we're trying to say is like, we have a ladder. That ladder might be imperfect right now, but we clearly need to begin taking some wild chances. And this is one I'm not here to court or say that crypto is the solution to climate change, but I feel very confident in saying that the solution involves crypto. So where are we now with your company? Is it ready to go or can people go there and find projects? I mean, where are we? Not yet. We are, we've been developing since last April. Mm -hmm. And I think that we'll be ready to go with what's called a main net launch. We're going to flip right. the switch on this, hopefully by early Q1. So I'm targeting April. Okay. We have a little bit of like auditing of the code that needs to happen, as well as just some legal issues that we want to be very cognizant of, given the status of crypto in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping KYC. that by April, we can turn the machine on. Mm -hmm. And then we have a few really exciting early deals in the hopper, some here in the US, some abroad. That we'll, bring, that we'll bring to the community that we will slowly trickle out in the spring and summertime, provided that we can do so in a, in a legally compliant way. KYC, that is what you're alluding to? or Yeah, Jesse, you knew where my mind was going. So for folks who just want to own Bitcoin, the coin, they would be able to buy that coin on an exchange as they would Bitcoin or Ethereum, and they would be KYC through their exchange. What's KYC for those who don't know? Great. Like me. It's called Know Your, know your Customer and AML, anti-money laundering. And anybody who's ever like opened up a bank account, especially the United States or the EU, these are like the very basic documents that you provide to your bank so they can ensure that you are who you say you are and you're a citizen of good standing. It's really for anti-money laundering purposes. And so 
many uh, crypto companies right now are not KYCing. That's a, a large problem for the SEC and other governmental bodies. So for us, we do anticipate that for some of these financial products, like maybe carbon credits and other forms of investing, we would be KYCing the opportunities. And it might be that in the United States, we would need those investors to be accredited investors as well, which breaks my heart that folks who are earning under a certain income level may not be able to participate, but that's, those are the laws that are on the books. There is um, one or two other crypto protocols who are doing somewhat similar things to us, not exact, but they're in the same game. And what, the way that they've launched before us is that they've blacklisted all US investors. So if you're in the United States, you cannot participate on their platforms, which is which such a crying shame. Well, Adam, it's uh, super exciting. If there's anything we can do, you know, we, we live this stuff every day. We certainly work with a lot of these clients, you know, a lot of these people trying to do good yeah. things around the world. The one thing I would say that is really important in something like this is just that you pick really good partners because one broken chain destroys it all. I know that for me and Priscilla, I mean, the stakes are a bit lower because we're just working for people, but we're pretty choosy about the the groups that we work with. And you know, what happens is, is after a while, those are the only groups you end up working with because the similar people are attracted to you, you know, but um, good partners, I think is always hard to find, especially around the world. Okay, Adam, we're exhausted. Um. <laughs> Priscilla. No, it's been and great. Guys, um, I'm exhausted because for my brain. Yeah, Adam, thanks for sharing all this yeah, with us. Yeah, it's great and, to meet uh, you. Yeah, and maybe we can have a conversation down the road, you know, because I think we might be able to help with some things, you know. Yeah, yeah. This was really terrific for me as well. Thank you for inviting me yeah. and for doing what you do every single day. And uh, when we're ready to go live, we'll definitely let you and your community know. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Bye, you guys.